Good morning. Good to be here with you today. If we haven't met, my name is Kyle. Well, thank you for saying it back. I didn't expect that. <laughs> Someone had their coffee this morning. Good morning to you. <laughs> That's awesome. Good morning. Uh, I, I'm so grateful to be here with you today. And uh, one of the things we've been doing kind of at the beginning of each message, doesn't matter who's up here speaking, whether it's me or someone else, uh, we've invited you to connect with us via social media. Part of the reason for me is that I answer emails kind of slowly. And so if you want to get in contact with me, you want to ask for prayer requests um, or anything else like that, um, social media is a great way to do that. I've already had some people reach out, um, prayer requests. We've talked about theology and other stuff like that. And some people point out things I get wrong in my message. Super appreciative about that. It's really good. So I do get the Things wrong, it happens. But if you'd like to connect with me, I would love to do that with you. One of the best ways is over social media. Now, we're in this series uh, called 90, and a couple weeks from now, uh, we are going to be celebrating Easter. Easter, a couple weeks from now. And usually it's time of year that we have a ton of people uh, in this room, and sometimes space is limited, and we don't know which gathering is going to be more full. So I'm just going to ask, can you guys exchange phone numbers with the person sitting next to you and just tell them when you're going to come so we can try to even this out as much as possible? That usually doesn't happen. But one of the things that we want to help you with in terms of getting prepared for Easter is our wonderful staff and uh, some of our volunteers as well have put together this Easter magazine. We started doing this last year uh, at Christmas. We put together a Christmas one with recipes and crossword puzzles and all that sort of stuff. And this one uh, has a lot of the, the different stuff that's Easter focused. So there are a bunch of devotionals in here. There's a fantastic crossword puzzle with a scripture on the bottom that's a, kind of like a pun for the crossword puzzle. And then there's a bunch of other stuff in here that we really think you'll really enjoy as you prepare your hearts, your minds, and your soul uh, for Easter. You can pick one of these up uh, outside. I will remind you of that at the end of our gathering today, but it's really awesome, and our people put a lot of work into this. So if you'd like to pick one of these up, we would love for you to do that. So today is uh, St. Patrick's Day, and I realize that my shoes have divided our church, and the reason for that is I put these on this morning, and I think they have a tint of green in them. And the people who said yes, no one loved Jesus, those things, people, it's true. But some of our staff and some other people said, no, they have gray, they are not green, and people have pinched me in the lobby, and I feel like that kind of violence has no place in Christianity. <laughs> so one of my friends, Matt, uh, gave me one of these, and so just know I have it on my person. Um, so please don't pinch me, I don't really like that. So... Speaking of dividing the church, not just my shoes, the thing we're going to talk about today is baptism. And baptism has actually divided the church for a very long time. And so I, I don't get really nervous when I come up here. I really enjoy being up here. I will say I was a tad bit nervous when I was doing research for this message and I was talking about it because baptism is so personal. And to teach anything uh, contrary to maybe what you were raised and what you were thought or a different church you went to or a different tradition, a different religion, it, it could poke you a little bit. And so I'm going to do my best um, to do just a small amount of that. Usually, usually the person who does it is actually Jesus, and I'm going to let him do that. But my hope today is to encourage you to either get baptized because you never have been, or what are the circumstances that you should get re-baptized? And some of that's going to push on you a little bit about how you've been raised or what you've been taught. And so that's okay. I invite you to do that. Um, just allow it to kind of sink in and go, man, do I need to make this decision for the first time? Or maybe my baptism you know, wasn't something that was my choice or something else. So we're going to try to talk about that today because we're going to talk about it in this way is that we're going to say that Jesus is our brief guide to our journey or Jesus is the guide to our brief journey, excuse me. Uh, all throughout this uh, month, we've been asking a particular question. We spent 90 days, we invited you guys and your friends and anybody else to spend 90 days with us uh, in Jesus because January, between the January 1st when we started this series and the, uh, the Saturday where Jesus sat in the tomb right before Easter, there are 90 days and our hope was to create a compelling case to say that Jesus is worthy to be the Lord and the Savior of your life. And we, we invited people to say, spend 90 days with us as we learn about Jesus. In month one, we talked about how what, what people said about Jesus, that everyone has an opinion about him. Uh, month two, we asked what Jesus said about himself. And then in month three, we're dealing with this issue, what makes Jesus unique? Or the question that we're asking is, what answers does Jesus only provide? No other being, no other deity, uh, no other person who has ever claimed to, to claim to have the claims that he has had. And today we're going to talk about this in kind of an interesting way in terms of his being the guide to our brief journey. And we're going to start in an interesting way. So can you put up the first one? We're going to start with Luke and Yoda. So I, I figured 
as I was doing research for this message and I was talking about Jesus as a guide that I would look up famous guides in movies. And so we start with Luke and Yoda. You kind of have to start off with them. Yoda obviously guided Luke and the force and basically was like a mentor of his. You can go to the next one. What about this one? If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you got Gandalf and Frodo. Most of us would think Gandalf is the central character. I'm one of those persons. But we also know that Frodo is the person who takes the ring uh, into Mordor. And so Gandalf guides him along the way. What about this one? Is a throwback. Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid. The ones of you who laughed just showed your age. It's okay. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Wax on, wax off. Catching a fly with chopsticks. Have you ever tried to do that? It is a waste of an hour of your day. Don't ask me how I know. Another one, maybe for people who are a little bit younger, Shifu and Po from Kung Fu Panda. If you haven't seen this movie yet, get a life. Go out there and watch it because it's pretty awesome. Shifu is pretty awesome. What about this one? A major throwback to Professor Keating, the Dead Poets Society, where he, he helps these students realize there's more to life. He jumps up on the desk and he says, oh, Captain, my Captain. It's a fabulous movie if you've never watched it. What about this one? Obi-Wan and Anakin. You know, some guides are better than others. I, if, if I was Obi-Wan, I wouldn't put this Padawan on my resume because he turns out to be Darth Vader. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie. And then what about this one? Peter Parker and Miles Morales um, in Into the Spider-Verse and the next kind of uh, version of Spider-Man. And so he guides him as well. I love that Peter's a dad in this one. He carries his spider baby around. It's pretty funny. And then one of my personal favorites is Morpheus and Neo of the Matrix. Is that Morpheus is guiding him along, teaching him all throughout these movies. Now, these characters aside, part of the reason I bring this up is that all these guides, in a sense, um, they, they did something with the, their pupils or their padawans or the people uh, that they were guiding. They saw something in them uh, that maybe they didn't see in themselves. They had the knowledge and the expertise. The reason they're guides and mentors is they either had the experience, the knowledge, the expertise, or they had been there before, and they guided someone else in a way that says, you need what I have. I can help you get to where you are going. And we believe that Jesus does that. I mean, Jesus lived on such a short period of time on this earth, at least the recorded history about him. His mission was only about three to three and a half years long. And in that short period of time, he guided his disciples into beginning the church. He gave them the Holy Spirit and he empowered them to do so. But for three to three and a half years, he said, this is how it is like. And he, he walked them through everything. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is baptism. Now, the other portion of today's message is Jesus is not just a guide, but the idea of his brief lifespan. Again, we only get about three to three and a half years of his life outside the birth narrative story. And the reason that's pivotal as well is that you and I, once you start to get to a certain age, you realize life goes fast, really fast. And the saying is the, the days are long and the years are short and things just speed by. And the reason that's so important is that you have a finite amount of time on this life on this earth. And so what you choose to do with your life really matters. And sometimes if our life is shortened, what we do with our lives and how we see our lives is even more massively important. Think of it this way. If you went to the doctor's office and they said, you have three months to live, do you think it would right reprioritize what you do and how you think and who you hang out with? Absolutely. Some people would say, I'm ditching the job. I'm going to go travel. I'm going to go to Disneyland, which sounds terrible to me. I hate that place. Or other places is that you would go, I'm going to do something different with the finite amount of time that I had. Now, what if the same doctor said, you have three months to live unless you made major changes to your life. And if you made major changes to your life, you could extend your lifespan. You probably wouldn't go off and have a bunch of fun. You would probably do what the doctor has asked because you want to extend your life. And what if someone came up to you and said, you have three months to live, but Based on your decisions and based on your lifestyle, you can not only live a better life now in this present, but it will prepare you for eternity. That death is not the end, that at some point you will live forever, and that there is a being out there who, want to reward, who wants to reward you for your life as you live it in allegiance to him right here and right now. That would change your perspective on life and how you live. And baptism, we believe, is essentially that. It changes your allegiance and your perspective, and it changes what you do with your life. And one of the great things about Jesus, one of the many great things, is that Jesus, as a leader, he always went first. 
He always went first in terms of service. He modeled service. He modeled compassion. He modeled what it was like to invite people into your life that other people wouldn't. And one of the things he did in terms of leadership and going first was actually baptism. And it begins in Matthew chapter 3, 13. Now, what was funny is I, I gave this uh, message uh, in the last gathering and a woman came up to me. She said, good for you for including Matthew three seventeen on Patrick's day. And I was like, I didn't even think about that because today is March 17th. Pretty awesome, huh? Okay, I thought it was awesome. Jeez. <laughs> Anyways, getting back to the message, you guys are like, that is not that cool. <laughs> then Jesus came from Galilee to John in the Jordan. So John and Jesus grow up together. They're technically cousins. And John and Jesus are very aware of each other. And John probably knew uh, who Jesus was. And he probably knew, based on growing up with him, that Jesus was a unique person, had this unique relationship with God. So imagine John's surprise, where John the Baptist, where you know his job description is in the title of his name. He baptizes people. If you don't, it's kind of like the most ironic name ever or something. So he's baptizing people. John is. And one day Jesus comes up to him. And John and Jesus have this exchange. He says, but John tried to stop him because Jesus came up to John in the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And yet you come to me. I mean, imagine John's surprise. He's like, if you are the savior of the world, what authority do I have to dip you in water? And Jesus answered him. He says, allow it for now, because it is the way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John allowed him to be baptized. So John's baptism was characterized by at least two things. Some people say three. I'm going to mention two. The first one is a baptism by water. John says he would baptize by water, but that Jesus Christ would uh, baptize others, or we would be baptized into the Holy Spirit and by fire. And so it's a different type of baptism. So John's baptism is characterized by water. The second thing is, is that John's baptism is characterized by repentance of someone's sins. Now, Jesus didn't need this part. He didn't sin. He was born without sin. He never sinned. He died for all people's sins. So he wouldn't need this part. So why would Jesus get baptized in the first place? Why? It's not just a modeling of this, but that part is important. You know, my thought is the reason that Jesus gets baptized is he wanted to submit to the will of his father. He wanted to say, God, not my will, but yours. And we kind of see that in the Garden of Gethsemane at the end of his life that Jesus pleads with the father and he says, not my will, but yours. So I think on the front end of Jesus's ministry, what he does is he showcases to John and everyone who is watching, but more so than anybody else, the father, that he would submit his will to whatever the father would ask of him. He would say, God, you are the person who I follow for the rest of my life. And this is what happens. When Jesus was baptized, he immediately came up out of the water and the heavens suddenly opened before him, uh, for him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove coming down. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased. In this beautiful picture, we see the triune God. We see father, son, and Holy Spirit all present and united in one place in time. And this is part of the reason that when someone gets baptized, we don't just get baptized in the name of one person, but three. They, we get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because they were unified in their purpose. One in essence, three in personhood, but that's a different message for a different time on the Trinity. So this is what happens at Jesus' baptism. He, he says basically to the world, my allegiance is to God the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He will enact my mission. So Jesus does his mission for about three to three and a half years. He's the guide for the disciples. He teaches them uh, how to live. He teaches them about the law and about grace. He teaches them about how to serve people. He teaches them about how faith should be uh, placed only in him. He teaches them about who he is. And then he gets crucified and resurrected. And then they truly believe he is who he says he is. And then he gives them a mission. He says, you know, I was only here for three to three and a half years uh, to talk with you and guide you about this. Now I'm handing this mission off to you. And it's in Matthew 28 that this happens. And he gives them commands. A lot of people think that commands are just like Old Testament law, but Jesus gave all sorts of commands. And so here are some of the ones he gave to his disciple, which include baptism. He says this, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And a shortcut way to think about this is 
All authority has been given to Jesus in the present. Everything was created through him and for him and by him. So that's the past. And then in the future, everything has been given to him as well. Because not only here on earth, but also in heaven. He says, go therefore. And this word go in the Greek is an imperative. It doesn't just mean if you've got some time on a Sunday or in between your work and your play. He tells the disciples, you must do this if you are really my disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus carries on this command that it was um, showcased at his baptism. And he says, teach them to obey. Teach them to observe and obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you to, all, to the end of the age. And he says, I, I will never leave you or forsake you. So they begin to do this and the church starts to grow. And when the church starts to grow, people give their life to Christ, they get baptized, the Holy Spirit does incredible things in their life, and the church begins to grow. But what happens is when you gather a lot of people, people start to argue about what's important. People start to argue about what's good. People start to argue about what Jesus really said and what he really meant. And as the church started to grow, one of the areas that became up for debate is baptism. Is some people said, as Paul will deal with in a minute, is that some people said, man, I got baptized by this person and not that person. So Paul says some people argued over who baptized them. I got baptized by Paul and other people got baptized by Apollos. And some people are like, ah, man, I wish I was baptized by Paul. And the good thing is no one was ever baptized by Jesus. Can you imagine like the way that you can hold that up? Who'd you get baptized by? I got baptized by Jesus. Yeah, my baptism is better. Can you imagine? We would totally do that as Christians. We would find a way to spiritually one-up someone. You know, you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. I'm saved too. Who'd you get baptized by? You know, it'd be so dumb, but we would find a way to do it. So luckily, Jesus never baptized anybody, but it still came up in the church. What was it for? Who did it? Why did they do it? And in one place, the Apostle Paul does this long way of describing the meaning behind baptism so no one lost the meaning of it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about baptism in different religions and in Catholicism and what our church believes in terms of baptism. So here's what Paul said in Romans 6, 1, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. So he says, what shall we say? Say then, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And so this was Paul's problem is that if you are to establish allegiance to Jesus, I mean, if you were to get baptized, you don't just go, great, I got a get past card, like I get out of jail free card. I can kind of do whatever I want. And Paul says, no, it's not what baptism is for. It is to show your allegiance, which means you put to death certain things and you put to death your ways and you now do things in terms of Jesus's way. So he says, what shall we go on? A sinning so the grace may increase by no means. For those who have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And he goes on to explain. We were therefore buried with him through baptism. And Paul's making an analogy. He's talking about the symbolic nature of baptism, that baptism symbolizes that you have put your sin to death, or more accurately, God has put your sin to death, and that you have chosen to hopefully keep it there, that you don't want that sin to come back into your life. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. For we know that the old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin may be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Now there's a lot going on here because the practicality is, is when Jesus died, he took all of the sins of the world and, and it killed him. And then he was in the grave silent. And then he comes back and he literally gets a new body. And so there's some an analogy and symbolism here is that when someone get baptized, one of the ways we would describe it is kind of when you're falling backwards and I'm kind of an aggressive baptizer. And so like you go down fast. So if you're getting baptized this Easter and you don't want that, do not ask for me, but you go down fast. You feel it. I want you to feel it. Okay. For a little extra money, I will keep your kids down a little bit longer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I won't do that. I have been asked though. I have been asked. 
So you go down, and the symbolism there is that when you're under the water, is that like it's, it's symbolic of Jesus' death and your sin staying in there. When you come out of the water, is that you have a new life. Symbolically, you have a new life, just as Jesus had a physical resurrection and new life. And so now, hopefully, you can no longer be slaves to sin. And Paul says, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So Paul continues, now, if we have died with Christ, we believe also that we will live with him. Your life will look different. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he now lives to God. So Paul is making this illustration that one of the things that's crucial about baptism is it symbolizes and hopefully enforces, or not enforces, it inspires you to live differently. That once you come up out of the water, you want to live differently. Now, I said baptism divides the church, and it does, because there are all sorts of ways that people get baptized. I want to explain a few of those. You've got a fair amount of Catholics, ex-Catholics, current Catholics, and I'm going to do my best to explain what the Catholic Church teaches and also what other religions teach, and then I'm going to try to tell you the best I can what we teach after using a different analogy. So a couple of the ways that baptism is described— one of the ways is paedo-baptism, which means the baptism of infants. The other way baptism is described is credo-baptism. If you're a note-taker, those are your special words for the day. And that means as someone who has responded in faith. Now, we have a lot of Catholics or ex-Catholics that go to this church and probably in this valley. And you may have been baptized as an infant. And one of the reasons that that happened is somewhere around the first or second century, the infant mortality rate was particularly high. And one of the great things, I think the, the intention was that some people believe that when uh, children were born, they were born into this planet with, um, what is it called? I hate it when I do this in front of people. That's great. I forget a word. <laughs> Original sin. Jeez, man. Original sin. They were, they, were, they, were, they were born with original sin. So they come into this world and they have original sin. And one of the ideas was if there was high infant mortality rate, if you died with that sin in your life, you went to hell. So the idea was to baptize infants in order for them to get to heaven. Now, there are several problems with this, I think. Is one is the belief that baptism will save you from sin. I don't think we believe that at this church. I don't personally believe that. But the idea was if you baptized an infant, they had the forgiveness of their sins. The Holy Spirit was upon them at baptism. And that child grew into their faith and someday would choose Christ and would, would grow into their faith. That's kind of what Catholics believe in a nutshell. And there are lots of other religions and also um, flavors of Christianity that believe this. If you're a Methodist, a Presbyterian, some forms of Reformed, uh, Mennonite brethren, and others, there are a few other denominations that practice infant baptism. And to be fair to infant baptism, when in the first century, men especially, they gave their life to Jesus. Their entire household was baptized. And that was kind of in the day. If you changed religions, especially if the man changed religions, your entire household, your wife, all of your kids, your servants, and your slaves back at that time would all convert to a different religions. Now, again, to be fair, this is something called an argument from silence, meaning if it's not in the Bible, it must not be taught against, meaning it's permissible for you to do. I don't hold that view personally, and our church doesn't hold that view. But it may be something that you grew up with. You were baptized as an infant because someone really wanted you to have a relationship with God, and that's beautiful and great. But the other side of that coin, or the other way of thinking about it, is credo-baptism. It's when you respond in faith. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But one of the ways I want to talk about this response is by this thing on my hand. You can see that I'm wearing a wedding ring. The reason the wedding ring is a, such a great analogy for baptism is it shows that I belong to someone. You know, my wife, Rachel, is incredible. She was already here in the last gathering, so I can say great things about her without her blushing. I married up for sure. I tell people she's one of the reasons I believe in God. She hates it when I say that, but she's not here, so it's okay. But I love her so much that someday I said, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And I, I want to showcase to you that I am invested in you. And I want to show that I will never belong to anybody else. And so you go to a wedding, you say vows, you say, I, I promise to have and to hold you or whatever, however you want to describe that. You promise not to do things. You promise to hold them above all else. You promise to put them. And then you put on something that showcases all of those vows and promises. And the reason this is so important is your faith is personal, 
Your faith is personal, but it can never be private. You can put that up there for me. Thank you very much. Your faith is personal, but can never be private. Can you imagine your marriage being private? No, neither of you would like that. Like if I took off this ring, I think my wife's super glued it on. That's pretty good. (laughs) If I took off this ring, does it mean I'm not married? No. The vows I took with her in her presence and the pledge I made before God and before her are the reason that I got married in the first place. This is significant because it showcases to her and anybody else, I am unavailable. And part of the reason I bring this up is because baptism is essentially the same thing. You are not available when you, baptize, when you get baptized. Your devotion and your allegiance changes from yourself, from your culture, from any other religion to one person, and that is Jesus Christ. That's why baptism is so pivotal. It showcases to your friends, your family, and anyone else that you invite, and especially to your church and to yourself, you are not for sale. You do not belong to anybody but Jesus. And your faith can never just be private because the way that you follow Jesus, it will enact itself in your relationships, in your marriage, at your work, or at least it should. Your faith can never be private. And part of the the reason this is such a good analogy, because it showcases everywhere I go, I tell someone I belong to someone. And baptism is similar, at least for a moment. It showcases to you and to anyone who has witnessed, and hopefully that you tell someone is that you belong to Jesus Christ ultimately. Now, I'm going to tell you some quick baptism facts real quick, and I want to say that some of the things I'm about to say are up for debate. You may not agree with them. I just want to tell you what our church teaches, and we're not fully united in this. I mean, we have people who are come to our church who may say, I agree with that one, but not that one. My, my, my job is hopefully unity, not that everyone believes the exact same thing. I want to give you some quick facts, and then I want to tell you, if you've never been baptized before, why you should get baptized, or if you've been baptized before, under what circumstances I think you should get re-baptized. So here's the first one. The first one is baptism is not required for salvation. It is evidence of salvation. Not everyone agrees with this. In fact, the Catholic Church and some other denominations of Christianity believe that you have to be baptized to get saved. Our church does not teach that. We believe that it is by grace through faith that Jesus Christ, that God's grace is what saved us and that we receive his salvation, not because of anything we have done to earn it, but we only receive it by faith. And faith, the Greek word pistis, just means trust, is that we transfer our trust from ourselves or anything else over to God. And we say, you are the reason we're saved, God, not because of anything that we do. It's through your actions, your death, and for the forgiveness of our sins that save us, and we receive that from you. Thank you so much. So we believe that baptism is not required for salvation. It's evidence of salvation. Number two is baptism requires understanding and should be a decision that is yours. Now, if you have been baptized as an infant, I would suggest that you get rebaptized. And part of the reason is, is that I think the decision needs to be yours. There's actually not an instance that I can think of where someone had the ability to get baptized and it it wasn't their decision and they decided not to do it. The only time I can think about it is the thief on the cross. And he didn't have like the opportunity. They're like, can you get me down from here so I can get baptized and then put me back up? Jesus told him he would be with him in paradise that day, but the guy chose to do it on the cross. And all throughout the New Testament, when the gospel is given, people ask the question, what should I do now? And Peter, especially in Acts uh, chapter 2, he says, give your life to Christ and get baptized. I think it should be a decision that is yours, not someone else's. Number three, is that baptism does not wash you clean. It shows that Jesus has made you clean. Baptism is not something that you go, man, I've been away from God for a while. And I've had this conversation with people before where they say, I've gone away from God for a while and I've done things that I'm not proud of and I feel spiritually dirty. I've committed sin, I've committed adultery, you know, I've, I've murdered someone and I feel like, hey, I, I can't get this off. It feels like it's stuck to me. Will you baptize me so that I can be made clean? And I would say, Jesus has already made you clean. Maybe the best thing is to recommit your life to Christ. But baptism is not used to make you clean. Through Jesus Christ, you already are. Number four, baptism is a deeply personal decision and a public display of devotion. 
Baptism can never be private. It always requires two people. You're not going to the baptism like, I'm going to dunk myself today. You can't even do that. If you can, your back is going to hurt. I don't know how you do that. It's terrible. But you need someone else to do that. You need a public witness. And part of the reason this is so amazing is that when you come out of the water and you clear the water from your eyes and you watch a crowd of people clap, you have joined the family of God. And we support you. You get a support system like no other on the planet. So you, hopefully you, you want to do that. So these are the baptism quick facts. There's a lot of other ones. Now I want to talk a little bit about why you should get baptized and why you should get rebaptized. I'm going to try to explain these the best I can. The first one is the most powerful, or the first two, I should say, are the most powerful and the easiest to understand, but maybe the hardest to accept. The first one is that Jesus got baptized, so there's no reason you shouldn't. He went first in this. I mean, think about it this way. If Jesus needed to get baptized, how arrogant would it be for us to be like, no, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I don't think I need that. And some people think that. Some people have been Christians their whole life, and they've never gotten baptized. They never saw the need for it. And maybe one of the strongest cases I can make is that Jesus did it first to fulfill all righteousness. The second one, possibly equally as helpful, is Jesus commands Christ's followers to get baptized. Did you know there's not an instance in the New Testament when someone gives their life to Christ that they don't get baptized? It always happens after they, get bapt- uh, they give their life to Christ. To say it a different way and to quote maybe some people who are a lot smarter than I, Christianity does not know a Christian that is not baptized, almost doesn't recognize them. Meaning Jesus commands this. He doesn't suggest it and say, hey, if you get around to it, if you want to jump in a pool, let's do this. He says, if you are going to be aligned with me, and if you're going to say, I'm your Lord, you have to get baptized. He commands it. It's not a suggestion. It's an imperative. He told his disciples, go and baptize people and teach them what I have commanded you. And in the New Testament, as people responded to faith in Christ, they got baptized because they wanted what Paul said in Romans 6. They wanted not only the symbolism, but they wanted the reality is that when you are saved through Jesus Christ and you trust him with your soul and with your life and with your afterlife, you hopefully want to put to death your sins. Now, that's incredibly challenging. And what Jesus and Paul are not saying is that once you get baptized, you'll never sin again. You know how I know? Some of you cut me off in the church parking lot. It's a sin. (laughs) I know you still do. And I still do as well. What he's saying is that to the best of your ability, baptism helps represent you putting your sin to death to the best of your ability. You know, religion says change and you will join us. And Jesus says join us and you will change. And you will change how you look at your sin, especially when you get baptized. Number three, you want to take your personal faith public. This is one of the greatest reasons to get baptized, is you want to take your personal faith public. As I said earlier, your faith can never be private. If you have a version of your faith that never impacts your marriage or your friends or your coworkers, I hate to tell you to you, you're not really a Christ follower because it changes everything about you. And one of the reasons that people go and do this publicly is because you were welcomed into the family of God. This is number four here. You want to commit to Christ's church. You want to say, I'm a part of you people. I'm with you. The great thing, one of the many great things about Christianity in general is when you get baptized, you say to the rest of the church, and hopefully the church says to you, you are one of us. You are in the family of God. We are one body. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, that we're one body in Christ. We're very different but we are all committed to one body. We are Christ's body. And that's not just in Minden, Nevada. That's through the entirety of the world. You join the largest movement in the history of all things. You take your faith public. And you know what the interesting thing about this is? Is that most people don't see their baptism this way, and I wish they would, and maybe today will be the first time you hear it. Some people think of their baptism as a choice that only affects them. And it's not true. And part of the reason for that is that when you get baptized, normally what happens, especially if you only do it once in your life, what do you do? You invite people. You invite people who are not Christians. And you know what happens? They come. Because the easiest thing to say is like, I'm only going to do this once in my life. Will you be there? 
It's hard to say no when you tell someone, I'm only doing this once. Your grandma, your nanny, if you have a nanny, I don't invite her to, it's fine. You got friends, you got neighbors, people who will never step foot in a church will probably come for your baptism. And it's an incredible witness to them because they get to experience a few things. They get to sit in a church and they probably get to go, oh, the worship was pretty good. Message, not so bad. Didn't fall asleep, except for once or so. Uh, and then when you get baptized and people clap and show their appreciation, I bet, this is my guess, I bet some people are like, I wish I had this. I wish I had this community around me. I wish I had the celebration that that person in the water had. Maybe you've never thought about it before, but your baptism is a witness to other people who do not yet know Jesus. And based on what you have done, you may help them be interested in taking their next step in, in Christ. That's why taking your faith public is so important. Number five, you've heard the gospel, <clears throat> received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and responded in repentance. This last point is very important. But this is the teachings of our church, is my personal opinion. It's also, as I read scripture, the interpretation I get from being baptized. Some of you have been baptized when you were infants. Can you do this as an infant? No. You may be able to hear the gospel, but you may not understand it. You probably can't receive it, and you can't respond in repentance. If you're a person who was baptized when you were a child or when you were too young to understand what you wanted or who Jesus was, my recommendation is you should get rebaptized. We want you to understand. Now, the other part of that story is we don't baptize people regardless of their age if they do not know what they are saying yes to. And I've gotten in trouble with parents and grandparents. They're like, we invited all the family in. And the kid comes up and they're just like, I don't want to get baptized. And I say, no. And they're like, you will baptize him. Grandma is here. And I'm like, no, I cannot do that. As much as I fear grandma, I will not do that. The thing is that like we really believe, and can't, again, this is counter teaching to probably Catholicism and other versions of Christianity where they say you can do it before you have a choice. I don't think so. I think as the New Testament shows, especially uh, the Gospels and especially Acts chapter 2, when, Jesus, when, when Peter gives this long sermon and at the end he tells him, and there's this word, this Greek word, ace, E-I-S, and they say, what should we do? And he says, get baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. The way I translate that is into the forgiveness of your sins. That, G, that Peter says, as you have given your life to Christ, get baptized into that knowledge. But they had to respond in faith. And my suggestion to you is if you got baptized as a kid or if you were too young or even as an adult and you had no idea what you were saying yes to, my encouragement to you is to get baptized again. Make the choice yours. Respond in faith and repentance. Say, God, I have sinned against you and my family and to the best of my ability, and I will not get that right all the time. I want to live for you for the rest of my life and get baptized. So I hope you do that. And I hope I've made a compelling case. And if I haven't, I've got one more thing. There's a, there's, if I didn't explain it enough, I hope you come to one of our adult classes, uh, March 17th and 24th and March 27th. We've got three different classes and maybe you have questions and maybe you're like, I need a little bit more information. I want to talk with someone about it. Please come to one of those. There's also a kid's class on March 27th. I would love during Easter for us to clap and to respond with gratitude and joy for you or someone you know who has gotten baptized because they have responded in faith to the gospel and they have said yes to making Jesus the Lord of their life. And to the best of your ability, you say, God, I want to repent of my sins and I want to live from here on out for you and for no one else. My allegiance is to you and no one else. Let me pray for you. Father, baptism is such a challenging subject because there are all sorts of ways you can go with this. Lord, ultimately, I hope we keep our focus on your son, Jesus Christ, that we are so grateful that he would save people like us. In the depths of our souls and in our minds, we probably know that it, we wouldn't save us. Lord, thank you so much for dying on the cross for us, for shedding your blood, and for cleansing us through your son, Jesus Help us respond to this message and to the gospel and ultimately to you with repentance to turn away from our sins to the best of our ability. 
and have us publicly share our faith through baptism if we haven't done it yet. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit is upon us as we make that decision, as we contemplate getting baptized again because the decision wasn't ours. And Lord, I pray that we invite people to Easter to witness the transforming power of your gospel through your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for being with me today. One last thing for you. Easter's coming up in a couple weeks, and we would love for you to, uh, to help us cook. There's a lot, we have a lot of guests, and so if, you, if you'd like to do that, you can take a pan out there. Don't forget to grab one of these Holy Week devotionals out there and sign up to get baptized if this message should compel you to do so. Thank you so much. You're already blessed in Christ. Have a great Sunday.